We're going to then build some more methods in our Pete's object. And then we will talk about constructors. Not sure how far we'll get today. If we'll get to all of those, we probably will, will, probably will at least touch on constructors today. But let's start off by looking at the pizza example we had last time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it. And then we'll take a look at the code. And we'll hope we'll understand what's going on there and get any questions resolved. All right, so it is in a folder called MUN, M-O-N, on the desktop. So let me go to the command prompt. I am going to... make it bigger so everyone can see. It opens up into that folder. From there, I CD to get to the desktop. Remember, if you're going down a folder, you type in CD in the name of the folder. So users LCCCC lab is the name of the user that is logged on on this machine. And underneath each user, there's a desktop folder. Don't believe me? We can type in dir to see that. So there's a desktop. So cd takes me down a folder. And from that desktop, the folder was called mun. So cd mun gets me in there. And that's where my stuff is. I'm going to clear the screen. Just out of safety, um, uh, safety, that sounds like a, um, that sounds like a scary ter uh, ter term, but I typically will always recompile a program before I run it, especially if I don't know, because it could be that last time I made a change to the Java code and forgot to recompile it. So if I'm going to start with Java code, I'm going to make sure I start with a clean set of class files. So I'm going to say, because right now, whoops, right now I can see there's my Java and my class files are there. But um, are they in sync? In other words, did I make a change to the class, I'm sorry, to the Java file and forget to recompile it last time? If you did, then it would be weird because you'd be looking at issues that you may have already corrected if the class and the Java file were out of sync. So just to be sure, and I do this with your homework too for the same reason, is I compile everything just to be sure. And I would suggest that's probably a good thing to do. You can type in Java C and then space uh, asterisk dot Java. That will compile everything that ends in a Java. Um, you don't really need to do that. It's just sort of quicker to type it that way for me. If you actually t uh, compile the test class, since it contains the pizza class, it'll actually compile them both. But again, it figures out what it needs to compile and compiles it. I just like to say Java C star dot Java, compile everything. Again, no news is good news when you're compiling in Java. Because it didn't tell me anything, that means it compiled cleanly. No errors, no warnings. I can DIR and I can see that stuff the compile for those two class files were updated. Let me run this. And I do that by typing in Java unit test. And it tells me the first pizza is thin, or is, is a thin crust, is a large, does not have pepperoni, and the bake time is 10 minutes. The second pizza bake time is 16 minutes. The third pizza, the bake time is 10 minutes. Now, if I was turning this in for an assignment, I might do some things to spruce it up a little bit. What I probably would do would be to do this. Let me go into Notepad++ and edit the test class. And I'll probably print out For each pizza, 
those characteristics. And remember to change that to P2, P2, P2. And then remember this task is performing the function that later on in the course the GUI will perform. Now, what's the GUI's responsibility? Well, is to take input, do its thing, do the calculations, and then display the results. So I want to display the results in an intelligible way. I just don't want to print out, like, 10. And, like, whoa, what does 10 mean, you know? Well, the baking time second piece is 10. Okay, that I understand. And I'm going to go and I'm going to test. I'm going to try early, which means I'm not going to just run for one pizza. If you remember in the pizza class, the, 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 the thickness of the crust determines how long it is to bake. A thin crust takes 10 minutes, a thick crust takes 16 minutes. All right? And so I'm going to go and I'm going to display for each of the three pizzas that I create the different properties that it has. I can even do something fancy if I feel so inclined and put like a black between the pizzas to make it even easier to read. That way, it'll really make it read. A little touches like this go far because it'll really help you with your testing. It'll really help you to see if you did it correctly and so on. So I would suggest take a couple of minutes to, like, instead of just doing a barely adequate job, do a good job on it. And that would include labeling your output, um, maybe putting dividers to separate things into sections. Uh, I didn't in this case, but comment your code. You know, well, I did sort of comment it. P1 is a thin crust test case. And I can say, should be 10 minutes bake time. So if anyone later on went and ran this test, they could look and say, okay, yeah, the thin crust did take 10 minutes to, to bake, and so on. So now, let's go and let's do that. And we should get some prettier output. And there we can see, I put the line in the wrong place, but there you can see a little bit nicer printout. And I can look and say, okay, a large pizza with a thin crust that doesn't have pepperoni yet, 10 minutes. That's what it should be. All right. So let's look a little more at code here. And we're going to start out looking at the pizza class. From here on in, all of our applications are going to involve more than one class. There will be one class that is the unit test class. It's, it's, it's a class that, whose purpose is to test the other classes and make sure that they're right. And it substitutes for a GUI. And a GUI was where you'd actually type in how big the pizza was and whether it has pepperoni and what kind of crust it has. Here, we're hard coding it in. And I know hard coding is bad under normal circumstances, but here we're just making a test class. This essentially is throwaway code. We just want to run our pizza class through some tests and make sure it's right. So for that, until we get a GUI, hard coding it like this is not a problem. All right? So the test class, all it's going to have, it's going to have one, typically all it's going to have is one public static void main. Because if you remember, every application needs one class who has this function in it. And that's the boss class. That's the class that runs and sort of does its thing and controls the operations of the other class. All right? We'll go over the details of this in a minute here. I do, I do want to do the pizza class first. So let's look at the pizza class. If you remember, pizza class, 
pizza classes. All classes have two things in them, all right? They have attributes. Another word for attributes is properties. Um, sometimes people say characteristics, all right? But a class has those, and a class also has methods or functions. Uh, the attributes are variables, and for now we're going to say they're available anywhere within the class. All right? And they should only be available within the class. You should not have the outside world be able to access these directly. Now, keep in mind, I think I said this last time, that especially early in the class, I'm going to speak in generalizations. And later on I'm going to talk about, well, okay, there's, yeah, there's some exceptions to that. No, to just about anything, there's an exception. So if I say these are always going to be private or protected, no always means almost always. I just don't want to say almost always and then you think you can change it wherever you want to. No, all right? For our purposes in these first few examples, those variables here, these attributes, are going to be private, all right? Which means they can be only accessed within the class itself. The outside world can't access them. And by outside world, I mean other classes. All right? That's important because another class may not know how to set the kind of crust, for example. It might not know what the legal values are for the size of crust. Now, later on in this course, we're going to have validation in this class that makes sure that you can only set the class to what it's supposed to be set to, thin or thick. Anything else will give you an error. We're not at that point yet, but just know that it's coming. So therefore, we're going to make those attributes private so no one can mess with them and no one can assign them values that are goofy. All right? And we're instead going to use methods or functions for the outside world to communicate with those properties. Because we still need the ability to create a pizza and say if it's a thin or thick crust and say whether it, it has pepperoni or, and say what size it is. So our test class, and, and later on our GUI, is going to need to be able to do that. But we just want to use the methods to do that and not just set them directly. All right, so this has three attributes. A string, which is a size, a string, which is a crust, and a boolean, which is whether it has pepperoni or not. Notice that this class is called pizza. The letter P is capitalized. The class is public, class, pizza. We have braces that go around the whole thing. And then we have the attributes signed or defined within those braces. So this has three attributes. String is capitalized because that is a class. String variables are actually objects. And a string is a class, as opposed to a primitive. We're going to spend a lot of time discussing the difference between string, uh, not strings, between uh, object references and primitives. But just know that they're different kinds of data. And there's really important differences between them. All right? So it's important to know whether something is a primitive or if it is an object reference. In this case, the string and the crust are object references. All right. Notice that each app has both a set and a get. And the format of these methods look the same, They're really consistent. The get method is what other classes are going to use to get the value of that attribute. Remember, we don't want them accessing that value directly because we're afraid that other classes could mess that up. All right? So we're going to give them a function, and we're going to control how that piece of data is accessed. So we have a get method. And public, string specifies what here? The return type. Right. This property size is a string, 
So this function to get that property is going to return a string. This is the name of the function. This is the list of arguments. There are typically no arguments in a get method. You simply say, give me that value. And typically, all this is going to say is return and the name of the property. All right? So get size. Since size is a string, it returns a string. We make the function get size. Size because in function or method names, the first character is lowercase. The first character of the first word is lowercase. Each subsequent word is capitalized. And then the whole thing is simply it's going gonna, it's gonna to return the value of this attribute. We then have the set method. And the set method is how we set the value of that attribute. Remember, we don't want to access that attribute directly. We don't want other classes to be able to just say, well, this object size equals boom, something. All right? We want to send it through a function. And here's the reason why. We're not ready for it, but later on, we're going to have code right here to validate. We're going to have a series of if statements or whatever to say, hey, if it's not equal to this or equal to that or equal to that, then there's an error. Okay? And if we were able to access this variable directly from the outside world, we could circumvent that. All right? So we're going to force people to use the gets and sets to access our attributes. And that makes our code a lot tighter a lot prone to, a lot less prone to having errors or people using the class incorrectly. Now again, this doesn't return anything because we're setting the value of that. However, it accepts a single argument. The type of argument is what? It's whatever the app is defined as. And we simply say whatever argument this is given, we set that size attribute to the value of the argument. And it has all three attributes, gets and sets. Finally, we have another method to calculate the bake time. And this is where we would have our functions that do some kind of like business logic. All right? In this case, we've determined that if it's a thin crust pizza, it takes 10 minutes to bake. If it's a thick crust pizza, it takes 16 minutes to bake. And therefore, we have an if statement. If the crust equals thin, then the bake time equals 10. Otherwise, the bake time equals 16. And then finally, we return the value of the bake time. Notice that the comparison of a string is done through the equals function. All right? That's how you have to compare strings or you run the potential for problems. Is there questions to any of this? All right, let's bounce back to the test, unit test and see how these two work together. Pizza P1 equals new pizza. Let's dissect this line, all right? This line is really sort of two statements smashed together, all right? We could have written it this, this way. We do this, that's the same as this and this. All right, so this sort of does two things. The first thing this does is this creates a variable, all right, called P1 that we're going to use to point to a pizza object. 
We're going to use it to refer to a pizza object. Now, that's one of the differences between primitives and objects. Primitives, as the name implies, are very simple. An integer, for example. Well, what is an integer? Well, it's just a number. That's the only thing that's important about an integer. We have an integer whose value is 4. We have an integer whose value is 12. An integer whose value is 58. That's all, we, that's all that we need to know to talk about an integer is the value of it. A pizza, though, is an object. And an object has what? It has properties. So with a pizza, there's not just a single value. There's the value for the size. There's the value for the type of crust. There's a value for whether it has pepperoni or not. In addition, we can perform functions on a pizza. We can ask the pizza, hey, how long will it take to bake? How long will it take you to bake? How much do you cost? And so on. So there is more to an object than there is to a primitive. Primitive typically is just a value. The object can have multiple values, right? A value for each attribute. And then an object also has functions that you can perform, like What's the bake time? What's the cost? And so on. So this says that we are creating a variable P1 that is going to be a reference to a pizza. It's going to point to a pizza. Now again, trust me, later on we'll talk about more about what that means, point to a pizza or reference a pizza. But for now, I, I want to start using that terminology. All right? So P1 is a variable that contains a pizza is a little inaccurate. Refers to a pizza is probably better. Well then, what pizza does it refer to? It refers to a brand new pizza that we're creating now. So the P1 variable that's going to point to a pizza, it's going to refer to a pizza, equals what? It equals a brand new pizza we're going to create right this second. All right? This says we're going to store a variable that points to a pizza. We're going, to, we're going to store a pizza object. We're going to store in the variable P1 a pointer to a pizza object. This says that variable P1 is going to point to this brand new pizza that we're creating. All right? If I do this, if I get rid of this, all right, let's try to compile it. I get an error, all right? I get because in this situation, the compiler is smart enough to say, I've declared this variable that is going to point to a pizza but I've never said what pizza is going to point to. And therefore, I can't do these things. I can't tell what a non-existent pizza's crust is or whatever. I can only do that to a real pizza. I can only put pepperoni on a real pizza. I can't put pepperoni on a non-existent pizza. All right? Now, on other occasions, you won't, the compiler isn't smart enough to know that you have not created a pizza object. And it will let you do it, and then your code will blow up later on. But as you can see right now, when you create a variable that's going to contain a pizza or any other object, it's not enough simply to declare that variable. You have to create, you have to point that variable at an object before you can use it. And this statement here, new pizza, means do this to a brand new pizza. What does that do at a technical level? That creates in memory the space for a pizza object. And it initializes the variables in the pizza object, which are what? Well, string, crust, pepperoni. All right. 
So this allocates the memory for the pointer, if we're going to get technical. This allocates the, the memory for the pizza object reference. This allocates the memory for the pizza itself. Two different things. We have a variable that points to an object. All right? Now, the thing on the right-hand side of the equal side is called a constructor. All right? Now, it sort of makes sense, constructor, construct. This is what builds the object. This is what makes the object, constructs the object in memory. All right? Now, if we look at a class, we have nothing in here called a constructor. All right? There is no constructor in this pizza object. All right? Here's how Java works. If you do not define a constructor in your Java class, the Java compiler creates one for you. All right? It doesn't show you it, it just does it. It does you a favor and just creates a, a, a constructor for you. But it creates a very, very, very simple constructor that all it does is it allocates the memory for the object and its attributes, and doesn't do any initialization. So if you define no constructors, then the object gets created, but no real initialization takes place. All right? Now, that's OK for what we did here. That worked fine, because we're just starting out. I created my new pizza object. I called these functions to initialize that pizza object's variables. And then I can go and I can do some calculations here. All right? And it works. So this creates a new pizza object in memory. This set pizza object size to large. So this makes that pizza that I just created a large pizza. This makes the crust thin, and this says it has no pepperoni. So now I can simply print that stuff back up, tell me what the size of the pizza is, tell me what the crust is, tell me if it has pepperoni, and now tell the bake time. And it will do the proper calculation of the bake time based on the way that those values are set. All right. In this case specifically, the only factor is the crust, the size of the crust, or the kind of crust that it has. Now, we can do this, and that's fine. But we may think to ourselves and say, you know, it would be nice if we could create that pizza object and initialize the variables all in one step. It might even be nice to default some of the properties if we don't know them when we create it. Like let's say if someone called in and said they wanted a large pizza but didn't tell us the crust size or whether it has pepperoni or not. Well, our restaurant probably has a default. Well, OK, they don't tell us. We assume they want a thin crust and no pepperoni. All right, that's our defaults. All right? So it would be nice to do all this in one step, where we create the object, create its memory, uh, create the memory for it, point to it, and oh, by the way, let's initialize these variables. Let's set the size to something, the crust to something, and finally, the, uh, uh, whether it has pepperoni or not, to something. Now, the default constructor doesn't do that. The default constructor, which has no arguments, doesn't allow you to do any initialization. 
it just makes that object in memory, allocates the memory for it. So for us to do initialization, we have to write our own constructor. So that's what we're going to do. All right? Now, a constructor is, sort of looks like a method, but it's not a method. All right? This will become important later on when we talk about inheritance. All right? Because constructors behave differently than other methods when we do inheritance. A constructor is going to still have the word public. And it's going to have the name of the class, though, instead of the method. And there's no values, there's no return value associated with a constructor. I just want to make sure I wasn't missing anything. So, in this case, I'm going to write a constructor that allows me to create the object and initialize the size, the crust, and has pepperoni. Now, what that means is when I call the constructor, I need to tell it what the size, the crust, and the pepperoni situation is. The way that you communicate with constructors or other functions is by, via arguments. That's where you tell additional information. So I'm going to create two strings called arg size. And a Boolean for arg has pepperoni. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign these attributes the values of the arguments. So size equals whatever we put in the size argument. Crust equals whatever we put in the crust argument. And have only is going to be what we put into the arg has pepperoni. So now, when we make this object using this constructor, we can kill two birds with one stone. We can make the object in memory, and we can initialize these variables. Now, people often ask me, if you create a constructor like this, do you still need the set method? And the answer is yeah. Because someone might change their mind and say, uh, I want a large, thick crust, uh, no pepperoni. And then say, well, and you've created that pizza object. The GUI has created that pizza object. Then they come back, no, I changed my mind. I want it with pepperoni. Well, you want to be able to change that attribute. So you create the object, but if it needs changed, you can use the set method. The idea when you create these classes is that you're creating something that's very flexible to use. So there will be more than one way to do something. And just depending on the situation, one way may be used or another way may be used. So yes, you will still have the set methods, even though you include that in the constructor. OK. Now, I'm going to go and try to compile this. All right? And I'm going to tell you now it's not going to work. All right? I like to tell people when I know it's not going to work, that way, they don't think that I messed up and I'm making up an excuse afterwards. All right? So this is not going to work. So I save that. And I go and try to compile it. 
I get three errors, each on the three statements that call the pizza constructor. I kind of alluded to why we would get this error. I kind of hinted around it. Let's see if anyone picked up on the hints. Why do I get this error when I say P1 pizza equals new pizza? Yes. Right. In other words, this worked before when I had no constructors, right? Remember, before I went and put this in, this pizza class had no constructors. What does that mean? It means the compiler created a constructor for us that accepted no arguments. All right. Well, I've supplied a, a constructor now. So guess what? The generated constructor that the compiler makes when you have no constructors goes away. The compiler more or less says, hey, you're handling the constructors yourself. I'm going to back off and let you do it however you want to. I'm not going to go and create a default constructor for you. Because you're creating constructors, you must know what you're doing with constructors and must understand which ones need made and which ones don't made, so I'm not going to generate one for you. So, what do we do? What we could do is we could actually go in and change these, not use the set, but to call the constructor with the appropriate arguments. Now the arguments, string for size, string for crust, boolean for hats, pepperoni. So I can go in here and say, first piece is large, thin crust, is also large, also with thick crust, and also does not have pepperoni. And third pizza is small, thick crust, and does have pepperoni. So now, as soon as I create those objects, I create them with a constructor that's accepting arguments. What arguments is it accepting? It's accepting three of them. One, two, three. Because of the arguments, I better supply it three arguments. And I supply it in the proper order. All right? If I define this has an arg size, and used to populate the size. Size needs to be the first argument when I call this constructor. Crust needs to be the second. Boolean needs to be the third. So this will call, this will create the pizza object, and it will initialize those variables at those values. And the rest of it should work the same. I should have taken a screenshot to compare it, but you can review back the recording if you want. Let's go compile it again. Now I don't get any errors, right? Because I'm calling the constructor that exists. And if I run it, it gives me same results as it did before. All right. Now, a class can have more than one constructor in it. In fact, a class will often have more than one constructor in it. If certain things can be defaulted. All right. So, 
maybe the default for, pe for pepperoni is false, right? In other words, you don't get pepperoni unless you ask for it, right? That makes sense. So if I call and say I want a pizza with thin crust, uh, large, and pepperoni, I get pepperoni. But if I say I want a pizza, thin crust, large, by default I don't get pepperoni. So the default for pepperoni is false. Unless I say I want pepperoni, I don't get it. So let's make a constructor that reflects that. So I can make a set constructor here that only accepts arguments. I'm just going to copy this. So it only accepts two arguments, the size and the crust. It sets the size, it sets the crust, and it defaults pepperoni to false. Okay? When you create a class like this, you will often give multiple constructors so if people have different information, they can call a constructor. When I say people, I mean other code, all right? Can call the appropriate constructor and it'll work. So now, I call that, this pizza gets the other, gets the second constructor I wrote, this pizza, and this pizza gets the first constructor that I wrote. How do you know what constructor to use when you call it? It looks at the number and the type of arguments. So, if I call this one, I'm passing string, string, boolean. String, string, boolean, that's the constructor that's going to use. If I call string, string, it's going to look and say string, string, boolean, that doesn't match. String, string, that does match. Now, what this means is you can have multiple constructors, but you cannot have multiple constructors that have the same number and types of arguments. So I could not make a second constructor for pizza that accepted two strings. Because then the compiler wouldn't know which constructor to use. All right? I also couldn't try and call a pizza with only one argument. Because there's no constructor that only has one argument. There's a constructor with two, three arguments and a constructor with two arguments. If I try to call a constructor with only one argument, guess what? I'm going to get a compile error. Oops. And it tells me in a roundabout way. All right, this is where it takes a little bit of skill to understand reading these. It says that there's no suitable constructor found for pizza string. But here's the constructors that are available. String, string, boolean, string, string. But there's none with just one string. Now, could we write a constructor with only one string? Sure. Getting back to the... Um, getting back to the um, idea of defaults. Let's say that our pizza place is known for their thin crust pizza. All right? That if, if, you don't, if you don't specify what kind of pizza you want, you're getting a thin crust. I could write an, uh, another constructor that only accepted one argument and It defaulted the other two. So then, I no longer get that error. And it would work. It assumed that 
If I just say the size of it, that we're talking about a thin crust no pepperoni pizza. I could, even if I wanted to, if it made sense, I could create an R uh, uh, constructor with no arguments. Let me give you an example of that, because that kind of sounds a little far-fetched, but bear with me here. Uh, when I went to Cleveland State, uh, there was a great pizza place called Daryl's right across the street from Cleveland State's campus. And I think later that place became the Rascal House or something, I don't know. But they always had a lunchtime special. And this may give you a tip off of how old I am, all right? 89 cents for a single pepperoni, small lunchtime pizza, personal pizza, all right? Which means that you probably spent more on your can of Coke than you did on the pizza, right? It was great. And they just did that to attract people. And they really had pretty good pizza, too. But if you went into Daryl's at lunchtime and said, I want a pizza, guess what? You got a small pepperoni thin crust. All right. So in that case, in that particular organization, you could say what their default pizza was. Now, could you say that for Pizza Hut? No, because you don't know what, what people are going to order at a Pizza Hut. Could you say that in other cases? No. But I could put in a no argument constructor if it made business sense. that accepted no arguments and defaulted all the values. And then I could just say, give me a pizza. It would call the no argument constructor, and it would default it. Now, how many constructors do you have in your class? Whatever makes business sense, all right? You're developing these classes to be flexible, but you don't want to give so much flexibility as to potentially have misuse from it. For example, if there was no real default pizza that people order, you wouldn't want to create a no argument constructor for it. Because then if that code was used, it would create pizza that probably had bad values to it. Let me just finish this up. I think I forgot to save it. And the one that I said there is small, thin, and all that. OK. Your next, next class will talk, will make some more functions. I had intended to do that today, but I started off talking about constructors and got on a roll. All right, so next time we'll go back and we'll talk more about making functions and the code to do that. Any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.